<laughs> All right, guys. You never know where you're going to end up as a combination vacation rental host and chronicler of the collapse of global industrial civilization. Uh, it takes you to some weird places. <laughs> but since I am completely booked up tonight, this is the busiest night I have ever had as a vacation host. There were 13 people right now at <coughs> Bugs in a Jar Farm all together. The most people we have ever had. And uh, so I am hiding out in my little doomsday camper here on... It is a Monday night, July 3rd, 2023. And I am sorry to report that I cannot see the super moon, the buck super moon tonight maybe tomorrow night but uh before i call it a night here in my little camper uh here on the eve of the fourth of july i will have to pick out a proper all-american uh chronicle tomorrow this is what i was going to do tonight uh Russia is accused of ecocide in Ukraine. But what does that mean? What does ecocide mean? Is there a definition of ecocide? And sure enough, there is. So what is the official definition of ecocide? Of course, I had this uh, whole thing highlighted and now it okay so whoever decides these things the panel defined ecocide as quote unlawful or wanton acts wanton w-a-n-t-o-n had to look up the definition of wanton sexually unrestrained Sexually unrestrained is the definition of wanton. So, uh, okay. So, unlawful or, or sexually unrestrained acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. There you go. So uh, we all know uh, what the number one act is. And of course... Uh, Let's see, did they rip down this comment from this fellow? I guess this fellow, Humpty Dumpty Tribe, once again, uh, Humpty Dumpty has had his, uh, I don't believe it, it is here with no, not one single thumbs up. Okay, this was Humpty Dumpty's comment, don't look at me. I got a vasectomy at age 22 before I committed the single biggest crime of ecocide ever conceived, ever conceived by the human race. Not one person has thumbed that comment up because nobody has any clue what Humpty Dumpty was talking about, about how does a vasectomy uh, have anything to do with preventing ecocide? But anyway, so that's enough of that rant. Uh, so I'm not going to waste any more time on the definition of ecocide, which is basically a, another... Uh, 
a synonym for breeding. And that's a euphemism for, we all know what breeding is a euphemism for. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> next to that story, the one that I went with, uh, we're going to look at the noble savages. The noble savages down there in Brazil. And this is kind of a reflection of this pretty somewhat similar to what I was saying in my book, Peruvian Plunge, that I wrote in 2009 when I forever stopped suffering from the myth of the noble savage. And so we're going to go to Brazil to see uh, what's going on with noble savages in Brazil. Okay, Amazon indigenous are leaving the rainforest for cities and finding urban poverty. So they're leaving, you know, uh, wilderness poverty and trading it for urban poverty. Uh, if you lived out in the middle of nowhere, you would do the same thing. Uh, you know, these noble savages, they're humans. They're humans. They want the same thing that all of us want. You know, this is why I, that, that, that I actually think that these people who try to separate indigenous people, of, of course, I don't need to get into that broken record rant. There is no such thing as an indigenous human to the Amazon rainforest. Okay? Get that out of your brain. Humans are not indigenous to the Amazon rainforest. They are an invasive species, otherwise known as an invader. Okay? Humans are not indigenous to the Amazon rainforest. They're not indigenous to anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. But uh, just so we, we get that little thing straight, that what humans are, they are invasive species. But anyway, we all know who we're talking about here. All right. Back in 1976, Binan Tuku ventured to meet a Brazilian government's expedition on the banks of the Itui River in a remote area of the western Amazon rainforest. After some initial suspicion, he and his father accepted machetes in, and soap in what was the beginning of the Mati tribe's contact with the non indigenous world, meaning with the second wave of invaders. Nearly 50 years later, Tuku's own son, Tumi, is now trying to carve out a living in the impoverished city of Atalaya do Norte. Instead of the traditional blowgun, Tumi held a pastry bag in his hands while working in a bakery and his face bore none of the tattoos or piercings characteristic of the Matis. Quoting the 24-year-old Tumi, quote, In the village, the quality of education is not as good as in the city. I want to engage, I want to engage with non-indigenous people, learn from the challenges I face, and perhaps one day return to my village to share my understanding of how the city functions with the elders, close quote. Thousands of in indigenous people like Tumi are migrating to cities like Atalaya do Norte, some in pursuit of a better education and some drawn by a federal welfare benefit 
that can ensnare them in urban poverty, huh? Their exodus is leaving villages to wither and raising concern that the world's largest tropical rainforest, crucial to stemming the worst of climate change, will be left without its most effective guardians. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into this whole, uh, this whole noble savage rant about uh, the original invaders of the Amazon being its most effective guardians. Okay? I ain't buying it. I've been down there. I've lived with these uh, Amazon guardians and, and their 36 inch chainsaws. Uh, and don't get me going because I know that uh, 50 people listening to this who have never been to the Amazon rainforest, never met a goddamn Amazon Indian, is sitting here, you know, accusing me of being a whatever, okay? Once you go down to the Amazon rainforest, live with these guys, okay? Check them out. See how long... Uh, the, uh, the, the noble savage fantasy exists in your little snowflake lefty head. It's going to go flying out the window, but you're not going to find any uh, Amazon Indians left in the Amazon rainforest because they're humans and they're going to the cities looking for, quote, an education, uh, you know, to learn Honky's ways, they're looking for the welfare check. They're, they're trading in, whether it's 12,000 or 100,000 years of their native cultures for a welfare check from Honky. Uh... This is just, I, I, I hate to burst your bubble. If someone had said this to me before I went down there and saw this with my own eyes, I, I, I would have said you're a Donald Trump voting right wing clueless moron who doesn't know what you're talking about. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> About half, now here in 2023, about half of the 6,200 indigenous people, you know, up until a few years ago, who lived in the Havari Valley, now live in urban centers. According to estimates by anthropologist um, Almario Alves Wadik, the Matis one of several indigenous people in the region, say almost half of their 600 people now live in that city. That number is likely to grow, huh? Said Benin Matis, who leads the Matis Indigenous Association and takes the name of his people as his surname. Benin said he fears the loss of his people's language and their exposure to drugs. Quote, In the village, there are few people. It's the older leaders. The youngsters are in the city, he said. No young Matis know how to make a blowgun, an arrow, when the students go to the village for vacation, they don't want to learn from the elders. They want to play soccer, have fun, and do things of the white man, close quote. Yes, they want to play soccer and have fun. If you're a young dude, and what do you want to do? Do you want to hang around with a bunch of old farts and, 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 and learn how to make a blowgun to shoot a monkey out of a tree, 
okay? Or do you want to go play soccer? You want to go play soccer. This is no shit Sherlock trading in the blowgun for the soccer. You know, when I was down there in the Peruvian Amazon, you know, building my tiny house, uh, this 27-year-old who, who thatched my, this was in 2009, uh, this fellow who made my thatched palm roof on my tiny house in, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon told me he was the only person his age, 27, and this was 13. 14, 14 years ago, he was the last person who knew how to thatch one of these roofs that all of the indigenous people now there were, were buying metal roofs now. Uh, this, is, this is no insult against uh, these indigenous people. It's insulting to... I think the, these people, uh, you know, talking about these noble savages and, and how these uh, Amazon Indians are guardians of the forest, uh, they're every bit is it's kind of a reverse racism. It's this little lefty snowflake myth. Uh, sorry, uh, you know who. <clears throat> Okay, so where were we? Uh, Bush Matisse, president of Univaha, the main association for indigenous people in the Havari Valley, worries that the urban migration will lead to cuts in health and edu education programs and the potential revocation of indigenous territories that might be opened for mining and drilling. This is exactly what uh, it, it is going on. It, it, it's, a, it, it's the same lesson out of the playbook what happened in our own country. Uh, 100, 150 years ago. You know, they, they get, they, they offer a welfare check and, and some bullshit promise of education and some machetes and some soap. They get the, the young people off of the reservation, the old people die, and the planet eaters go in there uh, and start drilling for oil and mining. This is open and shut. You know, it's right here in the mainstream media. If you don't want to listen to me, listen to the guys. Listen to the mot, the head of the main association for indigenous peoples in the Avari Valley. Uh, it is all about the revocation of indigenous territories that might then be open for mining and drilling. This, this is uh, where, gee, where have we heard this? Have you ever watched the show F Troop? I know I'm dating myself. <clears throat> the Amazon came under heavy pressure under far-right President Jair Bozo Nero, who favored development. His single term saw a surge in illegal mining and deforestation hit a 15-year high. Univaha recently established its own surveillance team to guard against illegal fishermen, miners, and loggers, a duty previously carried out by the villages. Yes, the initiative is crucial to protect you know, whatever remaining isolated indigenous who could be imperiled by something as simple as a flu carried in by invaders. Such tensions appears to be behind last year's killing of uh, indigenous expert Bruno Pereira and British journalist 
Don Phillips, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so, don't forget. So, how does this, this new planet-saving president, Lulo, or Lula, uh, so Lula has sought to lessen pressure on the Amazon since defeating Bozo Nero in last year's election. He established a ministry of indigenous, indigenous affairs in part to safeguard indigenous communities. <clears throat> a crucial part of that is improving education, a significant challenge in remote areas of the Amazon uh, indigenous families also face hostility from non-indigenous residents who see them as competition for limited resources, especially fish. Fish today, oil tomorrow. Uh, gee, can you say resource wars? Um... Uh, this is non-indigenous fisherman Antonio Alves. Quote, the Indians, the Indians come here. The government doesn't give them food, and they fish on our side of the river. When one of us mistreats someone, it's for our survival. Close quote. There you go. Uh, okay, so what did Lula, what was Lula up to when he was president 20 years ago? This is, this is a really interesting piece of information for the two or three people listening to me right now. The indigenous migration, you know, to the city is being driven in part by a, in part, yeah, uh, by, by a 95% part, by a federal program created 20 years ago in Lula's first term. The Bolsa Familia program was launched to provide cash to families if they immunize their children and keep them in school. Tens of thousands of indigenous families started frequenting cities to withdraw the cash benefit from state bank branches. There were dire consequences. Uh, for instance, indigenous people unaccustomed to handling money, you know, were just getting played. I mean, all of these scammers uh, stealing these, uh, their, their money, uh, blah, 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 uh, in the city, they stay in precarious conditions, vulnerable to alcohol and disease, often the Bolsa Familia payout is not enough to get them back home, not that they have any desire to go there. Uh, said anthropologist Waddick, quote, they conclude, as anyone would, that it's better to stay in the city receiving this amount and putting it towards studying since there isn't even a complete primary education in the village. Indigenous leaders say village schools are in shambles from poor maintenance and lack of oversight by governments. Uh, meanwhile, many indigenous teachers have been spending long periods in the city neglecting their work, but the money is not enough to cover life in the city either. The minimum payment is $125 per month plus plus small additions for pregnant women and for children depending on age. 
indigenous people often compete against each other for poorly paying jobs like collecting garbage or sweeping streets. Many endure hunger. Uh, said to me, who recently left the bakery to work for Univaha, quote, we need clothing. We need to eat every day to pay for electricity and water bills. If all of that were free, you know, like it was for, what, somewhere between $12,000 and $100,000 a year when they did not need clothing, you know, when they ran around naked for for 100,000 years or 12,000 years, you know, pick your number, uh, when they did not need clothing and uh, they had to eat, and when they did not need to pay for electricity, when they n did not need to eat water bills, to eat water bills, when they did not need to pay water bills because they drank out of the river, you know, those 100,000 years, and they ate every day by blowguns. So, if all of that were free, like it was for how many generations before Toomey, we could sustain ourselves with $125. Yes. Uh, anyway, and then they talk about um, another ministry goal is to improve education in the indigenous territories to reduce the incentive to leave. That is a daunting task with high cost for huge, remote, and impoverished areas. Nelly Marubo, an anthropologist who is indigenous herself, said her ideal is culturally adapted village schools where students have access to both indigenous and non-indigenous knowledge without needing to be in the city. But she was shocked by what she found when after just a five-year absence, she recently, we're talking 2018, uh, after a five-year absence, she recently visited her native region deep in the Havari Valley to film a documentary about her life. Quote, I always have in my mind lots of children and young people, but unfortunately, this time the visit was very sad. I found an abandoned village with only four elderly women. There you go. And, uh, of course, Humpty Dumpty weighing in on this one. The minimum payment is $125 a month, plus small additions for pregnant women and for children. How about a minimum payment of $200 a month if they agree to get a vasectomy or tubal ligation? Just thinking out of the poverty loop box here. There you go. I like these other comments. I suppose they will be in Dallas in a month. And welcome to the real jungle. <laughs> anyway, guys, uh, I, I understand that I'm talking to myself with my noble savage rants. And, and people think that I'm talking trash about uh, about Amazon Indians. They're humans, like, like the rest of us. They want an education. Uh, they want money. They want electricity. They want clothing. Uh, they want to eat every day. Uh, of course, they want internet. They want to play soccer. 
Uh, <laughs> and uh, off they go to the city, and when the cat's away, the mice play. This whole thing, get them out of the way and, and, and sucked away in this never-ending poverty loop. And then the planet eaters move in. Uh, this is not rocket science. I think John Perkins wrote a book about it called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. But uh, anyway, I understand I'm talking to myself and nobody gets it. Uh, go down there and spend some time. Go down there and look around. Uh, what, what, what's going on down there? If you want to be depressed, I mean, as I, I was down there in 2009. And uh, I, I, I saw this happening in 2009. This woman in here, uh, you know, she was down there in 2018. And then went back five years later and was shocked. Uh, oh well. I need to wrap this up because I am a busy vacation rental host. And I have a busy day on the 4th of July. Get out there and enjoy your noble savage fantasy while you still can and uh, we will pick out a appropriate rant to celebrate our own country tomorrow. Maybe we'll talk about some noble savages, what they think about the 4th of July. Bye guys. Oh, boy, what a night.